we're going to jump, continue our exploration of one of the most exciting books in the Bible, one of the most popular books in the Bible, one of the best, most documented books in the Bible. Um, we know that Daniel wrote Daniel for lots of reasons. There's, it has more archaeological support and other kinds of support that, than probably any other book in the Bible. But more importantly, Jesus Christ personally endorsed it, endorsed Daniel as a prophet, endorsed the book, in fact, quoted from it several times. He quoted mostly from Deuteronomy, but he quoted from all these, a lot of these books, and Daniel he quoted from several, several key places, as we will explore as we get into the book a little further. Now, we're in chapter 7. It's session 8, because we had extra session there on the Babylon thing, so the sessions don't equal chapters now. So we're at session 8, but chapter 7. And uh, this is probably the most comprehensive and detailed prophecy of future events found anywhere in the Old Testament. The most comprehensive and detailed summary of end time events that you'll find in the Old Testament. And um, so you want to, uh, uh, in your mind, you should have Daniel 2 in your mind. That should have been a review for last, from last time. We'll talk, we'll review it for you anyway. And then uh, Revelation 13, 17, so forth, they, they'll all impact what we're going to be dealing with here. Now let's back up a little bit to really get the book in focus because we've, we're, we have just crossed a barrier going from chapter 6 to chapter 7. See, the, Daniel consists of 12 chapters. The first six are historical. They're basically narratives. The last six, from chapter 7 to 12, are the prophecies, and they're not in chronological order. The first six chapters we just finished. We, chapter 1, that's when Daniel's deported as a teenager. And by the way, most people don't realize he was of the tribe of Judah. He was in the royal line. It's academic because that he's, that he's not in the genealogy as such. But the point is, anyway, he's de deported as a teenager to be trained, uh, given three-year postgraduate school at, uh, to serve at court, he and his three buddies. Chapter 2 is the famous dream of Nebuchadnezzar, another very important chapter that we will review here shortly just to have fresh in our minds before we plunge into 7. And then chapter 3, of course, is the famous fiery furnace scene, Bauer Burn, I sometimes call it, and uh, one that is prophetic in some very profound ways. And, of course, the most interesting thing in chapter 3 is what's not mentioned. You all know the story, but what's, what's interesting is not mentioned. Daniel's not mentioned. Daniel isn't there. And some people make a big thing of that for some reasons. Chapter 4, Nebuchadnezzar has another dream, and the Lord gives him a lesson on pride. And he goes through a seven-year convalescence, mental derangement, as, a, as God's object lesson to him. And the one that took care of him during those seven years was none other than Daniel himself. Nebuchadnezzar wrote chapter 4. It's his testimony. I personally suspect I'll meet Nebuchadnezzar in heaven. And... Uh, so uh, I'm reminded of someone who challenged that. You know, what if he's not in heaven? He says, well, then you'll meet him. <laughs> no, that's a paraphrase of a little Salvation Army girl that was confronted by, uh, I think, Harry Emerson Frostick, one of the great atheists on the street, and he challenged her, and, and uh, you really believe in Jonah and so forth. And, and that's... And, and uh, what about such and such? He says, I don't know. When I get to heaven, I'll ask him. He says, what if he's not in heaven? Then you ask him. See, she really nailed me. <laughs> so. Anyway, chapter 5 was the fall of Babylon, which, of course, is a very, very key thing in historical terms. It's also a key thing prophetically because it also gave rise to an extra session that we inserted on Babylon future. And, uh, and then uh, we took the interesting event of Daniel in the lion's den. And... Uh, and use that as a departure to explore what the Magi really are all about. Now, the point, one of the points that you want to keep in mind, it's more, more important uh, uh, than may seem uh, on the surface. The first, uh, uh, of the first seven chapters, chapters 2 through 7 are not in Hebrew. They're in Aramaic, which was the language in Babylon. It was the Gentile language of that day. So on the one hand, we're still in the, this will be the last chapter in the Aramaic portion of Daniel, even though it's not part of the first, sec the first section, is really the historical section, 1 through 6. And uh, the visions are from chapter 7 through 12, times the Gentiles, the ram and the he goat, chapter 8. Chapter 9 is the most astonishing passage in the entire Bible. We'll focus probably two sessions on that. And then uh, 
We'll talk about, we'll also get a glimpse in chapter 10. Chapter 10 is really just an introduction to the final part of the book. But you get a glimpse of the dark side of the spirit world, a very strange one. And then 11 and 12 are the, the well, chapter 11 mostly from 5 through 35 is the silent, the years between the, new t the, the two testaments. We'll talk about that when we get there, of course. And then the consummation of all things in chapter 12, which Jesus quotes from very, very significantly. But the, the point is these chapters are not in chronological order. Um, chapters 1, 2, 3, and 4 were pretty straightforward. Then we went to chapter 5 and 6, of course. But chapters 7 and 8 occur between chapters 4 and 5. You'll discover that there's references there to Belshazzar, Nebuchadnezzar's grandson. And uh, so it's before, the, you see, it's chapter 5 when the uh, Babylon falls to the Persians. And uh, chapter 9 and also 10 through 12 are subsequent. So this is the chronological order, and that can be confusing to many people. But looking at another way, we have the introduction to the king's dream, Barburn, and chapter 4, the, the, the ego trip of Nebuchadnezzar. It was after that, but before chapter 5, that the Times of Gentiles chapter, the one we're looking at tonight, occurs. There'll be another chapter next time on the ram and the he-goat. Both of these occur prior to the fall of Babylon to the Persians, which occurs in chapter 5. See, there, understand, the first six chapters are in chronological order. The prophecies follow, but they're also in chronological order. See, after the plot of the Magi, which were the guys that were upset because Daniel was put in charge of this hereditary priesthood called the Magi. Um, but it's after that event, the lion's den thing, that the, Daniel gets treated to, by Gabriel to the most astonishing passage in the entire Bible and the one that Jesus points his disciples to as the key to end time prophecy. So we'll look at that, of course, and then there's the, 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 rap, the rest of the prophecy. So that's a way of looking at it. Again, you need to understand that those, there are certain chapters two through six historically, and chapter seven as a vision, are in Aramaic. Why are they in Aramaic? Because the focus, interestingly enough, is the Gentile world. The Bible generally talks about uh, 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 history, both past and future history, through the lens of Israel. Almost everything in the Bible is portrayed from the point of view of God's chosen people and, uh, and, and uh, through, through whom the Messiah was brought uh, forth. But there are a couple of exceptions, and the chapter 2 and chapter 7 are among the most conspicuous of those exceptions because we have in view not the history of Israel, the history of the world, the Gentile dominion. And uh, so that makes, it, uh, that's, that makes it distinctive. And of course, tonight we are plunging into the last of those chapters, in some respects a climactic chapter, from a Gentile perspective. And so now, just by way of review, it'd be useful for all of us to refresh our memories uh, on the whole issue of tr that we explored in chapter 2. That's where Nebuchadnezzar faced with these, um, uh, as a young king, he, his fathers die, he takes it over, and he, he inherits the staff groups that were advisors to his father. So he has this very troubling dream, and he puts them to the test by pretending to have forgotten the dream and asking them not just to interpret it, but to tell him what the dream was. He wants to find out if these guys really have some kind of special skill or not. And you, the dream, of course, Daniel comes forth and uh, describes the dream to him, which, of course, establishes his credibility. And then he interprets it for you in chapter 2. And this, the dream, of course, involved this metal image, head of gold, arms and chest of silver, belly and thighs of brass, and legs and feet of iron. In fact, the feet are iron mixed with clay. You'd be tempted to assume there's five elements there. There's actually four with a variation of the fourth, and uh, that'll become very clear as we get into chapter seven. And of course, Dan the, the dream involved a stone cut without hands that st struck it at the, at the feet, and that stone grew to become a mountain that filled not just that region, but the entire world. Very strange dream. You can understand why Nebuchadnezzar was confused. Daniel interprets for him. He says, you are the head of gold. What it turns out to be is a timeline of four great empires. Babylon, which is the, ex the, uh, the empire extant at the time, and he points out that you're going to be succeeded by another, and in turn by another, and uh, then finally another, and I'm going to call it Rome 1 and Rome 2, because most scholars recognize that this fourth empire does not get conquered by a succeeding empire. Babylon's conquered by the Persians, 
and that occurs about uh, 539 BC. And the Persians are there for almost two centuries until Alexander the Great conquers the Persians. And the Greeks, and then he dies, and his four, four of his key generals take you know, divide up the empire. And we'll talk about that in great detail in, when we get to chapter 8 of Daniel and uh, subsequently. But Greece, of course, is ultimately conquered by Rome. Who conquered Rome? The answer is no one. Rome fractionates into pieces. And those pieces will ultimately reassemble to be the final empire that God himself uh, uh, replaces with his own kingdom. And that's what this chapter is going to dramatize for us. Now, uh, obviously, most of us are familiar with the first, the early empires of Assyria and Egypt, um, and uh, that preceded Babylon. But Daniel's uh, uh, visions are during the, the, uh, the Babylonian Empire, a city uh, that is a, a pawn of Assyrian politics until a, the young king, Nebuchadnezzar, establishes its dominance and it becomes the Babylonian Empire that we've been reviewing. And it gets, of course, conquered by the Persians. And the Persian Empire is very powerful, very large, very substantial, but it, in turn, gets conquered by the Greeks. And uh, when Alexander dies, the Greek Empire is divided among his four of its key generals. Cassander takes the far west. Lysimachus takes that portion that you and I think of as Turkey. Seleucus takes the east and Ptolemy the south. And the two uh, guerrillas on the block, so to speak, are Seleucus and Ptolemy. And they're constantly, the dynasty, their successive dynasties, half a dozen of them, um, uh, fight over the turf between them, which of course is Israel. And it's interesting, the chronicle of that period is written in advance. You find books called uh, the Silent Years, books that describe the history. At, but after the Old Testament, before the New Testament, they call those the Silent Years. Well, they're not silent at all. They're written in advance. You'll, we'll find them in Daniel chapter 11 when we get there, from verses 5 to 35. And they're so precise, so detailed, that critics have tried to argue that it had to be written later. It couldn't have been prophetic. That's a little embarrassing because they're part of the Tanakh, part of the Old Testament, which is translated into Greek three centuries before Christ, Christ's ministry. So there's an interesting uh, apologetic involved there. But in any case, um, we'll get to that when the time comes. But the Roman Empire, of course, then succeeds uh, all of this, and uh, it, uh, the western part of it starts to fractionate about 476 A.D. The eastern leg survives an additional thousand years before it is run over by the Moors. But that's just by way of background that we reviewed when we were in Chapter 2. It's important to have that in our minds as we jump into Chapter 7, so I've indulged in a little bit of review here. So now we're in Daniel Chapter 7, which can be called by many names, the four visions that he sees come out of the sea and so forth. Um, Daniel's going to see four bizarre uh, creatures come out of the great sea. The great sea was a term for the Mediterranean, and all these empires, of course, are uh, on the Mediterranean, interestingly enough. But the sea may be even more broadly symbolic than just geographic there. But in any case, the times of the Gentiles. And that phrase comes out of Luke 21-24, where uh, uh, we're told there that J Jerusalem shall be trodden down of the Gentiles until the times of the Gentiles be fulfilled. Thus that phrase becomes a term of art in prophet, prophetic studies. The times of the Gentiles start with Nebuchadnezzar. That's when uh, it's regarded as, as the Gentiles having dominion for, uh, on the planet Earth. And it will continue until a, the final world leader, the Antichrist. Don't confuse the term the times of the Gentiles with a term that Paul uses for the fullness of the Gentiles, which is for the church. A number, because part of the period that we're in is, is God calling his, his out of the Gentiles. And uh, that's a, that is a term Paul uses in uh, Romans 11:25 of the church. Don't confuse the two. They're very quite distinctive. Well, let's just jump in. Chapter 7, verse 1. In the first year of Belshazzar, king of Babylon, Daniel had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream and told the sum of the matters. Now, you realize Nabonidus was the king of Babylon, and, and secular history for many, many years made fun of the book of Daniel because they had no record of a Belshazzar. Everybody knew that Nabonidus was the king of Babylon until the Persians conquered it. What they didn't know is Nabonidus wasn't there, didn't want to be there, hadn't been there for 14 years. He put his uh, son in charge and uh, went off to play games in northern Arabia with some other things he was doing. So Belshazzar was the operating king, and that's why he offers Daniel the third in the kingdom. Why? Because he's the second in the kingdom, even though he's king. He's, he's there by, as a co-regent, in effect. 
Anyway, Belshazzar, the king of Babylon, in that first year of his, I realize this is now before Daniel chapter 5. It's, a, it's an insertion here. Daniel had a dream. This is in contrast to uh, a dream and visions of his head, so um, up on his bed. Now, uh, scholars make a big thing, what's a dream, what's a vision? Well, he's on his bed, and so he's got part of this is like a dream state, part of it's an actual vision where he's conscious. Um, I don't know how we're going to split hairs there. Does it matter? I don't think so. Let's move on. But uh, the, he had a dream and visions of his head upon his bed, and he wrote the dream. He obviously recognized this was important, so he jotted as much as he could down and told the sum of the matters. Uh, he was about 67 years old. That's going to be important to understand when we get to chapter 9 because we're, he, the 70 years are starting to get near the end. And that's going to set the stage for some things that are coming. Nebuchadnezzar had died about nine years earlier. So there's some time has gone by since, since all of that. And uh, now, um, Daniel spake and said, I saw in my vision... If you're studying Daniel very carefully, this catches you by surprise because up till now he spoke in the third person, like he would as a historian. But the visions he puts in the first person singular. And it's a very distinct shift in, in uh, style. And it also emphasized these are visions given directly to Daniel. These are not dreams of Nebuchadnezzar that he's interpreting. There were two of those, um, chapter 2 and chapter 4. But no, he, he, he said, he, Daniel Spain said, I saw in my vision by night. And behold, the four winds of the heaven strove upon the great sea. Now, you can visualize this several ways. You can visualize this as literal winds blowing on the Mediterranean. The great sea was a term they used of the Mediterranean. On the other hand, this is a vision and heavens involved. The, four, the word winds in Hebrew is ruach. It's the same word you use for spirit. So four spirits are churning up the great sea. And the, great, the sea in Revelation and elsewhere is often used as an idiom for the mass of humanity. And uh, so it, uh, it, it's not going to change anything profoundly, but you can see that two different ways. You can see it in a literal sense of the Mediterranean, and you can also see it as an idiom of something uh, uh, you know, more symbolic, broader, what have you. And four great beasts came up from the sea, diverse one from another. And clearly these are not aquatic creatures. These aren't some kind of uh, animal out of the ocean. That would be pretty obvious. So that means I don't think it's too important to regard the sea as the Mediterranean. I suspect the sea is simply the, the background, the fabric, from which God brings up these creatures to communicate to Daniel. And they're diverse one from another. We're going to discover that these four beasts are four kingdoms. That will be explained in the, next few, in the next few verses. Let's talk about these four beasts. Beast number one, to keep them clear. Uh, see, in verse 17, these four, they'll mention that the four beasts are four kingdoms. But the first was like a lion and had eagle's wings. And I beheld the wings thereof were plucked, and it was lifted up from the earth and made to stand on the feet as a man, and a man's heart was given to it. Now, I think most of us have seen, I forgot, I meant to get a slide and put it in here, I didn't get... Uh, you get uh, follow through with it. Most of you have seen pictures of the famous gates of Babylon where you have winged lions as the, the artistic motif uh, for Babylon. First was like a lion, had eagle's wings. So that happens to have, I wouldn't make too much of that, but in the British Museum you can see these things, a lion on the, gate, uh, on the gates of Babylon, a uh, winged lion on the gates. You'll also find references of this sort of thing all through Jeremiah, chapter 4, 48, all the way through it. Um, and Ezekiel and so forth. But there's something interesting here. He was made to stand up on his feet as a man and a man's heart was given to it. Um, my personal conjecture is that this could be an allusion to the fact that Nebuchadnezzar was saved. He was given a new heart. Because when you read chapter 4, I can make, a, I think, a good case from the scripture that he, in fact, was saved before he died. Uh, uh, under the tutorage, to, uh, to a very intimate relationship with uh, Daniel. But, uh, and that may be an allusion to that. There may be something more to that. Let's move on. Let's look at beast number two. Behold another beast, a second, like to a bear. So this is quite different than a winged lion. So 
Don't, uh, he's not saying it was a winged lion or, you know, before. It's just like a winged lion. This is like a bear. It's not a bear. This isn't the Russian bear or whatever. A lot of people try to, you know, they, they, they use contemporary idioms to try to look at this. It says, like to a bear, and it raised up itself on one side, and it had three ribs in the mouth of it, between the teeth of it. And they said, thus unto it, arise, devour much flesh. It's, it, it raised up on one side. You know, it's interesting. A bear is less regal than a lion. It's, in fact, ponderous, but of formidable strength. And this, we believe, is an allusion to Persia. And I'll show you why as we go a little further. But the, uh, remember, we, uh, we, remember we had the gold, the silver. The silver was Persia. We'll, we'll, we'll do a diagram, a summary, as we get through this. Um, to give you a feeling of strength, Xerxes f field two and a half million men in his army. That's a big number in today's world. Can you imagine what it was like in the ancient world? The Persians were formidable, very ponderous, very slow, very powerful. Uh, Cyrus conquered most of his acquisitions without even a battle. They yielded just on his appearance on the horizon. And uh, Ekpatana, his, his father-in-law, yielded that way, in effect, without a battle, and so did uh, Babylon, actually. It had three ribs in the mouth of it, and most scholars uh, recognize there were three primary conquests that established the Persian Empire. Babylon, Egypt, and Lydia uh, were defeated, and that's in Isaiah 13 and other places. And uh, most uh, scholars presume that the three ribs are the three big battles that established this empire, which originally was a pair, Medes and Persians, but obviously the Persians end up dominating the thing. In fact, it's generally commonly reckon reckoned as the Persian Empire. But originally it was the Medo-Persian Empire because uh, uh, Cyrus was half and half. He was, uh, uh, his father was uh, Persian and his mother was uh, uh, Medan. And he combined the two to make the empire and so forth. So we went through all of that uh, in background for chapter 5. Um, so that's the second beast. Well, beast number 3. After this, in verse 6, After this I beheld, and lo, another, like a leopard, which had upon the back of it four wings of a fowl. So this is, again, a winged creature. So the implication is that it was fast moving. In fact, we're going to see this in another vision in the next chapter, in which it moves so fast it doesn't even seem to touch the ground. The speed of Alexander the Great's conquests is astonishing. In just a few years, he conquered most of the known world. At the age of 29, he is said to have fallen on his bed crying because there are no more worlds left to conquer. All the way to India. And uh, on, so that, that may be may, the four wings of a fowl may be descriptive of that. The beast also had four heads, and dominion was given to it. It's interesting, I didn't point it out earlier, but if you'll notice in each one of these verses, dominion is given to them. Now, we always visualize them conquering, and that's why they're strong. We, the biblical view is that they were given, that it was God allowed them the dominion. And uh, uh, you know, it's a theological point, but a, a fundamental one. And... Uh, the beast also had four heads. Now, Alexander, uh, when he completed his conquest, he dies at a very young age. And uh, on his deathbed, he, the, the, at least the story goes, is that they ask him, Who, to whom does the empire go? And he says, give it to the strong. That was guaranteed to have a little uh, tension in the staff meetings. Um, and so four of the top generals divide up the thing. We're going to study this at some length as we go. But... Uh, uh, let's just move on. Uh, 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 that becomes the, the Greek Empire under four of them and the, 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 the Seleucids and the Ptolemies and so forth. Beast number four, Daniel verse seven. After this, I saw in the night visions and behold a fourth beast, dreadful and terrible and strong exceedingly. And it had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it and it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it, and it had ten horns. Now this fourth beast is going to be the subject of a lot of discussion. It's very interesting to me that as we get through this chapter, you'll discover that beast number one, two, and three was, n was no problem for Daniel. He doesn't even ask many questions about it. This fourth beast, fortunately, he asks a lot of questions about it. And we're very grateful for that because this is the one we're interested in 
had a lot of personal interest here. Um, it's also interesting that the previous three beasts, he at least used animals as sort of a, an idiom to talk about them. You know, a winged lion and a bear and whatever. He can't even come up with any kind of a relevant animal idiom here. He just calls it the great and terrible beast, the dreadful and terrible beast, strong exceedingly. It's interesting to me that it had iron teeth. That to me sounds like a linkage to the one in Daniel 2, and we'll take a look at that in a minute. Um, it devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with the feet of it. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. Now you say, wait a minute, how, could, how was it diverse? All these guys that went before were conquerors, had armies, took what they could, and built their empire. How was this one any different? I'll tell you how it was different. It destroyed rather than take advantage of. You may recall Nebuchadnezzar when he conquered Jerusalem. He picked the best young men to put him in graduate school, to, to learn from them what to, 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 when he conquered a, a, a place, he tried to pick the values there to take advantage of. He took the best men and took them to graduate school. He's a very enlightened kind of guy in that respect. And uh, when you get to the Persians, same thing. There were many Jewish leaders in the history of Persia. They amalgamated. They took advantage of, 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 of the talent. Um, uh, and and, uh, and like, likewise the Greeks. They, they enforced their language to unify things, but they tried to take advantage of things. Uh, in fact, Cyrus, you remember Cyrus took pride in honoring the religion of the people he conquered. He helped them rebuild their temple, and not just not the Jewish temple only, others too. Rome had a whole different approach. They took pride in what they could destroy. And uh, uh, as you study the, 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 the Roman army, was a formidable entity. When you enlisted in the Roman army, you enlisted for 25 years. At the end of 25 years, you got land and citizenship, and that was worth going for. But 25 years was enlistment, so that was, I don't I think you re-upped, I think that was it, yeah. And, uh, but uh, uh, when, when some, when, when some uh, town woke up one morning and saw the Roman army on the horizon, they were panicked because they knew what they would do is they would dig around that town build a trench and build a wall and be prepared to stay there for 25 years if necessary and starve them out. And uh, they were uh, intrepid. They were uh, ruthless. Um, you see um, a little of that captured in some of the more uh, competent movies. The gladiator gets that across in terms of the, the power that was Rome. But they took pride in what they destroyed. And uh, so here we are. It was, dis it was um, great and ter uh, terrible, strong exceedingly, had great iron teeth. It devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue of the feet. They tried to wipe out uh, those that, they, that, that were behind them. And it was diverse from all the beasts that were before it. And it had ten horns. And we'll talk a lot about those ten horns. And you, obviously it's suggestive. Remember Dan uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar's dream? beast in the iron feet had ten toes. Here we have ten horns. It's a totally different set of idioms. It's interesting that Nebuchadnezzar was presented the same information through the, uh, the idiom of bright shiny metals, emphasizing unity in a sense. Um, but this is not man's view. This is God's view confided to Daniel. And the same four em 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 uh, empires are portrayed as Consuming voracious beasts, emphasizing their, their, their violence and the rest of it. Now in verse 8, we encounter an eleventh horn. Everybody knows about the ten horns, because there's so much said about it. But, and they all know about the little horn, but I want to emphasize the fact that the little horn is not one of the ten. He comes up among the ten, between the ten. And so I'm going to call him, he's known as the little horn. There's a little horn here and there's a little horn in, da in chapter 8 we'll get to. But the, uh, Daniel says, I considered the horns, and behold, there came up among them another little horn, an eleventh in other words, before whom there were three of the first horns plucked up by the roots. In other words, we have an emerging leader, leader here that starts very diminutively. He's called the little horn, but he's going to end up being the big uh, kahuna here. 
and uh, three of them don't go along with his program. And he apparently explains it to them more clearly. <laughs> three of the first horns were plucked up by the roots, and behold, in this horn were eyes like the eyes of a man, and a mouth speaking great things. A horn is a strange idiom for you and me because we don't use, we're not sensitive to that, but in the primitive cultures, the power of an animal was exemplified by its horn. It may have many horns, you know, like an antlers, as we think of it, or it can be a, a, a single horn, like a, 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 some animals do. Um, but a horn thus became an idiom for authority or power. And uh, that's foreign to our cultural vocabulary, but it's very, very common in the ancient literature and certainly very common in the bi biblical literature. So when you have a little horn, this is a, someone with authority that emerges. And he has eyes like a man and he has a mouth speaking great things, which it means it's a person. It's an office, of course, but it's a person. It's a leader. It's a guy. Just like Nebuchadnezzar was Babylon, this guy is the, the, the for lack of another term right now, the little horn. We're going to discover as we get, we're going to get into him a great deal, and get chapter 11 and 12 especially, we're going to learn a lot about this guy. It's astonishing that his career and his background, there's even a physical description of him in the Bible. And we'll talk about that as we go. Uh, there's actually 33 labels for him in the Old Testament and 13 in the New, by at least one, by at least one reckoning. And uh, so he's, it, it, it's amazing how much visibility in the Bible uh, occurs about this guy. But this is the first time he shows up in the book of Daniel. He'll we'll learn a lot more as we go. But it's a person. Now it's interesting that uh, in the book of Revelation we're going to discover that he has a head wound that apparently everybody thinks he's dead but he comes back to life. And a, big, a lot of debate among scholars, is it a real death? And you know, Because Jesus says, I alone have the keys of hell and of death. So they say, well it can't be a real death, it's a counterfeit death. Doesn't matter. Because everybody, it's an effective counterfeit. Everybody thinks he's dead and he shows up, you know, so anyway. But of all the labels, the one to me that's the most descriptive, the one that's never used. If I was going to pick a label for this guy, I'd call him Mr. Big Mouth. And you think I'm being a little flippant or facetious right now, you watch. You'll see again and again and again in Daniel, again and again and again in Revelation, that he's the, he has a mouth speaking great things. He's a boaster. He says uh, blasphemies against the Most High. He is always shooting off his mouth. So it's, uh, uh, I'm not being flippant or here, or maybe I'm a little bit, but uh, that's, one of his, that's one of his interesting characteristics. Um, we're going to uh, look at verse 19 through 26 before we're through, and that'll talk, tell us a lot more about this guy. But he's clearly an, in, in, uh, 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 an individual that we're going to be talking a lot more about. Let's go to the next verse, verse 9. Daniel says, I beheld till the thrones were not cast down. That's an unfortunate translation. They were placed. Somehow they, uh, the, 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 the word can mean several things, but when, you, when it sounded like the thrones were cast down, uh, it's misleading. The thrones were placed, and the ancient and the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, and the hair of his head like pure wool. His throne was like the fiery flame, and his wheels as burning fire. And we could spend an easy hour, if we wanted to, to track down all the different allusions to fire and the throne of God. Uh, we go through all through the Psalms. He's a consuming fire in the Torah in many places. And we go on and on, but uh, I don't think we have to badger that to death. Um, also, Fire is used as his judgment, uh, and that's what's suggestive of the fire. Sodom and Gomorrah being an example. Um, they have an abidu in the uh, in Leviticus 10 and, and so forth. Um, so the, the, if you've done any reading on Isaiah or Ezekiel, the, the, the throne associated with fire is, is, is a comfortable term. But it's interesting here. There is a subtlety in this verse that I find quite fascinating. I beheld till the thrones. The word is plural, all right? But then it goes on to talk about a specific throne, namely the one that the Ancient of Days... Who's the Ancient of Days? God, sure. And uh, uh, the Ancient of Days did sit, whose garment was white as snow, righteous and so forth. The hair of his head was like pure wool and so forth. Okay. But it's interesting. See, that's why I think the King James translators, when the thrones were placed, 
they may have assumed that since it's plural, it was talking about the thrones of the previous verses, that they were cast down, and now we're talking about the throne of God. But that's not what the grammar says. I beheld that the thrones were placed, and the Ancient of Days did sit, obviously on one of them. I think this is kind of interesting because there are 24 thrones that we know are there from Revelation chapter 1 and 4 and so forth. Why aren't they mentioned in the Old Testament? Can anyone tell me why the 24 thrones that the 24 elders sit on are clearly spelled out in Revelation and they're alluded to here, but the 24 elders are not? And the answer to that little riddle is in Ephesians 3 and in Matthew 13. There is something that Jesus talked to his disciples about in Matthew 13 that was a something he, he was revealing to them something that was hidden since the foundation of the world, which means it's not in the Old Testament. Paul tells us in Ephesians 3 that it, it was his unique privilege to reveal something that was previously not revealed, not in the Old Testament. And that's the church. That's the church. When you do a careful study of the 24 elders, uh, you'll find, I think, ample evidence that it's an allusion uh, to the church. It's interesting that we have the thrones alluded to here, but the 24 elders are not visible. And it appears that that's a consistent policy in the, in the design of the scripture, that the mystery of the church, we're going we're gonna to get into this when we get to uh, uh, Daniel 9, but in any case, uh, it's just a... a, a, a uh, uh, a hint here, but I think it's very profound. I beheld till the thrones were cast, uh, placed, and the Ancient of Days did sit, and he goes on and on, so that's fine. Okay, verse 10. A fiery stream issued and came forth from before him. Thousand thousands ministered unto him, and ten thousand times ten thousand stood before him. The judgment was set, and the books were opened. Heavy stuff. Heavy stuff. And then we have, Daniel continues about what I, the guy that I call Mr. Big Mouth. Daniel says, I beheld then because of the voice of the great words which the horn spake. I beheld even till the beast was slain and his body destroyed and given to the burning flame. So the big, the Mr. Big Mouth is shooting off his mouth, but he is going to get, he's going to get his due. And uh, he'll be thrown in the burning flame. We'll discover when you get to Revelation that he's thrown in the burning flame before the thousand-year reign starts. At the end of the thousand years, he's still in there burning. Verse 12. As concerning the rest of the beasts, they had their dominion taken away, yet their lives were prolonged for a season and a time. And uh, these three preceding beasts, if you will, will be relieved of their power by the, 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 the uh, little horn and so forth, by probably military conquest, I assume. But uh, the fourth beast will be relieved of his power, by not, not militarily, but by divine judgment. But the three that were relieved will be allowed to live for a time. And Joel talks about that. Matthew 25 deals with that. And Revelation 1, and we'll talk more about it before it's all over, too. Um, so they will, the three that were put down will be, will, will, um, be in another form in, uh, in the beast that replaces them. Now, meanwhile, let's look at the fourth beast. If we're right about its Rome, Rome obviously is on the rise. The, the four elements that the Greek Empire broke up into, Cassander, Lysimachus, Seleucus, and Ptolemy, one by one they fall to Rome. Cassander's kingdom in the far west falls first, 146 B.C., then Lysimachus, 133 and then Seleucus in 64 B.C., and finally Ptolemy in 31 B.C. So God is setting up the New Testament period by having Rome, with its logistic controls and its, and its administrative skill, set up the world to streamline it for the gospel. To span out. It's interesting to realize how the Roman roads, the Roman communication, the Roman laws uh, provided an environment for the gospel to spread throughout the world. And uh, so... He preceded that, of course, with a language being in common throughout the world. The Greek language was an enforced language. So we have a common language. It wasn't Latin. It was Greek. And then a common administration. 
Verse 13, Daniel continues, I saw in the night visions, and behold, one like the Son of Man came with the clouds of heaven and came to the Ancient of Days, and they brought him near before him. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. It's interesting how he adopts this phrase in the New Testament for himself. He frequently refers to himself as the Son of Man. You know, that, and the reason that is so distinctive because here you have the creator of the world incarnate as the Son of a Man. Astonishing. Probably the most incredible mystery how deity, how he can be fully God and fully man at the same time. But in any case, he came with the clouds of heaven, came to the ancient of days, and they brought him near before him. And there was given him dominion and glory and a kingdom that all people, nations, and languages should serve him. His dominion is an everlasting dominion which shall not pass away, and his kingdom that which shall not be destroyed. All these other kingdoms that he's talked about were, 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 were scheduled for destruction. The gold, the silver, the brass, the iron, and, and or whichever idioms you want to use from Daniel 2 or 7, they have a terminus. This one does not. This shall never be destroyed. Um, all people, nations, and languages. You know, it's interesting. You, re you may recall in Matthew 4 and Luke 4, Jesus was confronted by Satan who made the boast that all people and nations belong to me and I can give them to whoever I will. Jesus did not challenge his ownership. If, he, if, if that was an empty boast, it wouldn't have been a temptation. These nations and languages and peoples belong to Satan. They're his. And uh, Christ didn't challenge his ownership. He did challenge his proposition. And the general theological view is that that proposition that Satan offered Christ, we will offer to another who will accept it. And that's the one we call the great, you know, the coming world leader. But at this stage, that's over. God, ha he has... He is given to him was dominion, glory, and kingdom, all people, nations, and languages. Another way of viewing this, he purchased that on a cross on Judea some 2,000 years ago. And he's taking possession of that which he purchased. This is the, the greatest escrow closing in the universe. It occurs in Revelation chapter 5. I, Daniel, was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my body, and the visions of my head troubled me. The word for body there, by the way, is a sheath. I think it's a very interesting word. It's sort of like the sheath for a sword. I was grieved in my spirit in the midst of my sheath. <laughs> and the visions of my head troubled me. Um, he's really troubled. Um, very disturbing stuff. He says, I came near unto one of them that stood by. Sounds like there's a gathering here of some kind. I came near unto one of them that stood by. See, this causes me to presume that this is probably very parallel or analogous to what John experienced in Revelation, where he was transported into heaven to given, given a, a view of what's coming. Um, it says, I was in the Spirit on the Lord's Day. I don't think that means he was in the Spirit on Sunday. I think he was in the Spirit on the day of the Lord. He was propelled through time to the climax to see what was happening. Again, and there again, he's, he's, there's the other people around. Um, so you get the same impression here that Daniel isn't alone seeing some kind of uh, you know, uh, uh, visual presentation. There are people around. I came near unto one of them and stood by and asked him the truth of all this. And so he told me and made me know the interpretation of the things. And now, now, see, what we've seen so far, you've heard a combination of the text, which we know, and some of my conjectures. Let's now pay attention to what the, the Scripture itself is going to illuminate for us. See, these great beasts, which are four, not five, four, are four kings or kingdoms which shall arise out of the earth. See, they're arising out of the earth, not the sea. The visions are in the sea. That's why I treat the sea as strictly idiomatic, not as a literal sea, Mediterranean or otherwise, um, which shall arise out of the earth, out of the planet earth, if you will. But the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever, even forever and ever. So that's sort of a summary statement. In other words, you've got all these beasts that are successive, but when the smoke clears, the saints of the Most High shall take the kingdom and possess the kingdom forever and ever, uh, even forever and ever. So that's, that's, that's the ultimate key point, underline, paragraph. Then I would know the truth of the fourth beast. I'm so grateful for Daniel. You know, he didn't ask about 
beast number one, two, or three. He doesn't need to. I think we got a good clue. He fortunately asked about the fourth beast. I wish the disciples were straightforward. Get to Matthew 13, and Jesus gives them seven disciples, uh, seven uh, parables, and he explains a couple of them. And then he, and, and there's some real surprises in them, apparently. And he says, did you understand these? And they said, yes. So he didn't explain the others. I could ring their necks. Why didn't he say no? Let them explain all seven, you know. <laughs> but anyway, then I would know the truth of the fourth beast, which was diverse from all the others. That's important to keep in mind. It's different than all the, all the others. Exceeding dreadful, whose teeth were of iron. There it is again. And his nails of brass. Ooh, that's interesting which devoured and break in pieces and stamped the residue with his feet. See, there again, it's reemphasizing those characteristics. And of the ten horns that were in his head, and of the other, see, not the ten, an eleventh one, and the other which came up, and before whom three fell, even of that horn that had eyes, and a mouth that spake very great things, whose look was more stout than his fellows. I beheld... And the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. Whoops. That last verse, verse 21, should give you a problem. I beheld the same horn made war with the saints and prevailed against them. That really bothers me. Why does it bother me? Because in Matthew 16 at Caesarea Philippi, Jesus himself said of the church that the gates of hell shall not prevail against it. Same word. Overcome, prevail. So you could, it would seem that there's a contradiction here. This contradiction is emphasized again because in Revelation chapter 13, speaking of the Antichrist, it says that he will overcome the saints. And that would seem to contradict Matthew 16. That's if you fall into the presumption that all saints are in the same bucket. And what you really, if you do your, see, some, in fact, uh, in a recent interview that I was involved with, uh, uh, they were doing a video, a television thing, or a, a film thing, and we got into some discussions there about, you know, you know what translations is important to get into Greek or Hebrew. Absolutely. You don't have to know Greek or Hebrew to get into it. You can just consult a good exegete and get, but get in and understand what the words are. Because precision is absolutely critical. And as you do that, you'll discover, of course, that, um, and I'll use John the Baptist as my favorite example, Jesus said of John the Baptist, he that is born of woman, no, no, no man born of woman is greater than John. That's quite a statement of a person. No man born of woman is greater than John. Uh, except Jesus Christ, of course. But you know, that's a phenomenal statement. That's, I mean, I mean he's, he's above Moses, above Abraham. And, you know, you, no man born of woman is greater than John. But then in his next breath, he says, he that's least in the kingdom of heaven is greater than John. What does that mean? And he explains that a few verses later. Whether you're looking at Matthew 11 or Luke 16, you can check it out. In both places he says essentially the same thing. Um, the law and the prophets were until John. See, John the Baptist closed the Old Testament. The Old Testament didn't close with Malachi. That's the last book in the order we happen to have them. Uh, not the order they originally, but that's neither here. That's just the collection. Of, that's, the li that's, a, that's a library catalog issue. Uh, when did the Old Testament con finish? John the Baptist closed the Old Testament. Jesus said so in Luke 16, 16, and Matthew 11. So, um, so we know that there are distinctives between the Old Testament saint and the church. In fact, Paul's burden in his letters is to get across these things that blew his mind. He knew the Old Testament. He was taught by Gamaliel. He was, a, he was, a, he was an expert. Um, and yet he was blown away by the realization that you and I enjoy privileges that were unthinkable to the Old Testament saint, that were sealed by the Holy Spirit, and so on and so forth. Except the church is, is started with a miracle in Acts 2 and it will end with a miracle. But it's a parenthesis. There are people that are going to be saved under a different set of conditions. The Holy Spirit does it in each case, of course. But the, you, So you'll discover that if you're precise in your use of language, you'll discover there are saints in the Old Testament, called the Old Testament saints for lack of a better label, there's the church, the mystery of the church I'm speaking of, not, not a denomination, but the, the, mystery, the, the, the mystery of the church. And then there's the post-rapture, or the trip, what some people call the tribulation saints. And uh, they're different. And so this is, in fact, a proof for you that the church doesn't go through the tribulation. Because the people here, the Antichrist is going to 
um, prevail against. It says so here and it says in Revelation 13. But that's, that's, a, that's distinct from what Jesus told us in Matthew 16. So I'll leave that to you to dig in, come to your own conclusions about that, but recognize that that's a, at least a view. Um, verse 22, until the Ancient of Days came and judgment was given to the saints of the Most High, and the time came that the saints possessed the kingdom. And uh, they will, the, 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 uh, uh, obviously the judgment is going to be by God, and uh, Israel will no longer be under the rule of the little horn, which will have happened up till then. And uh, obviously the, uh, all, her, all the blessings to Israel that were covenanted by God in the Old Testament and confirmed in the New will finally uh, devolve upon Israel. Verse 23, thus he said, and by the way, this, this interpreter for Daniel is explaining all this to him, starts a sentence here and finishes it a couple of verses later. What we're going to see is, a, is one big uh, passage by him. Thus, thus he said, The fourth beast shall be the fourth kingdom upon the earth, which shall be diverse from all kingdoms, and shall devour the whole earth, and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. This is not speaking of the Medita Mediterranean world, I believe. I think this is a global issue. I don't believe this necessarily means it's all going to be peace and harmony around the world because there's going to be obviously there's Armageddon, there's factions that are still fighting. But the point is there will be a global government. This is one there are, you can you can from secular logic pretty much convince yourself that there's no alternative. The proliferation of nuclear weapons imply the need for global supervision. Terrorism has just, it makes it makes a mockery of borders. The economies of scale and technology now uh, have evaporated so that small groups with modest capitalization can bring down the house. It used to be that uh, the gunpowder revolution meant that the, the economies of scale and violence was in the hands of governments. That's what led to, to the large governments. But that, th those days are over. The economies of scale are no longer the, pur pur the uh, purview of governments alone. So it's going to be a, there's a global government coming. And of course, global government implies global tyranny. They shall devour the whole earth and shall tread it down and break it in pieces. And the ten horns out of this kingdom are ten kings that shall arise. Many of us, me included, didn't take note of that phrase. When the European uh, under, uh, community became ten nations, we all got excited. There's the ten. We didn't pay attention. No, the ten come out of the combination. It's not ten that come together. There's a combination out of which ten will turn out to be dominant. There will be eleventh that will take over and, you know, the three and so forth. There are ten kings that shall arise and another shall arise after them. So who's the Antichrist? I don't know. I won't know who he is until I know who the ten are. I don't know who the ten are yet. The ten will, are yet to arise out of the combination. And, he shall, and, and, and another shall arise after them. I think it's absolutely pointless to speculate on who the Antichrist is for lots of reasons. This verse alone, because until you know who the ten are, you don't know who the eleventh is going to be, my suggestion. And furthermore, if you understand 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 carefully, there, you'll discover that a precondition to him being revealed is the rapture of the church, I believe. But study it yourself, come to your own conclusions. He shall be diverse from the first, and he shall subdue three kings. And he shall speak, here it is again, he shall speak great words against the Most High. <laughs> Mr. Big Mouth. He shall speak great words against the Most High and shall wear out the saints of the Most High. And think to change the times and the laws. And I was quite startled to discover the word laws there is singular, not plural. So if it's the law, then it's the Torah. Maybe that's a, a translational issue. In any case, they shall be given into his hand until a time, times, and the dividing of time. Strange phrase, very strange phrase. We're going to find uh, that, uh, let, me not leave, let me come to that in a minute. He shall speak, speak great words against the Most High. 
This is the same expression we find in Revelation 13. In fact, I think we'll have time before we're through. We'll go take a quick look at the first half of Revelation 13 while this is all fresh in your mind. Um, anyway, she'll speak great words against the Most High. She'll wear out the saints of the Most High. He'll think to change the times and the laws. And they shall be given unto, into his hand until a time, times the dividing time. This is a strange phrase in, 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 in the English. A time is obviously singular. The word times is not a plural. It looks like a plural. In English, it's a plural. In some languages, they have a dual. They used to have it in Aramaic, but it finally got lost. Uh, they have a sing some languages have a single, a dual, and a plural. And the only place I can find it in English is in only one case I can think of. If I said to you, all my friends came over last night, both of them. See? You chuckle because that means I only have two friends. See, a both is, is, is not plural, it's, a, it's limited to two, right? It's, it's not quite the same thing, but it gives you the idea. Grammatically, some languages provide for a singular and a dual, and this is one of them. Time and times and the dividing of time, or the splitting of time, the half a time. Time, times, and half a time. Times is a dual, lost in the Aramaic. So what we really have said here, time, singular, times, two and a half. This is a way of saying three and a half. It doesn't occur just here. It also occurs in Daniel chapter 12, verse 7. It occurs in Revelation chapter 12, verse 14. But that's not all. If that was all, we'd say, well, it gets interesting. The Holy Spirit seems to have gone out of his way to nail this down as a literal per period of time because we also have in Daniel 9.27 and in, in, in 12.7 this period of referring to three and a half years. And uh, we have in Revelation 11.2 and 13.5, twice in Revelation, the same period of time is called 42 months. And then also in uh, Revelation 11.3 and Daniel 12.6, it's called 1260 days. You can take three and a half years. You can take half of seven year period. That's three and a half years. In fact, that's the last one. Thinking, yeah, in Daniel 9, we'll discover it's very important. There's a half a week, uh, there's a week of years. This is half a week of years or three and a half years or it's 42 months, 1260 days. The Holy Spirit did everything we put into nanoseconds for you. He, it, I think this is reemphasized and reemphasized both Old and New Testament. This is the most documented interval of time in the entire history, in the, in, in the entire Bible. And it's, it, it's, it's on a horizon. I'm not saying it's going to start next Tuesday, don't misunderstand me, but it's coming. And it's, uh, all the things it talks about are, are on the horizon. How distant is a matter of speculation, but this is a lot closer than most people have any idea. Time, times, and half a time, strange phrase. But three and a half years, 42 months, 12, 60 days, take your, take your pick. Let's go on, verse 26. But the judgment shall sit, and they shall take away his dominion to consume and to destroy it unto the end. And the kingdom and dominion and the greatness of the kingdom under the whole heaven, not the whole earth, the whole heaven, shall be given to the people of the saints of the Most High, whose kingdom is an everlasting kingdom, and all dominions shall serve and obey him. Hitherto is the end of the matter. This concludes, by the way, the sentence that was started in verse 23. It's like a, like a, it's broken up in English sentences, but it's like one long uh, tirade here. As for me, Daniel, my cogitations much troubled me. Uh, that's kind of formal King James English. What it really says is, color me shocked. And that sounds flippant. That's really the way it would translate. And my countenance changed in me. And um, he, uh, he shook up about it. And my countenance changed in me, but I kept the matter in my heart. Now, at this point, something very important happens. From here on, the book of Daniel re reverts back to Hebrew because the rest of the book is going to be prophetic, even with more detail, but its focus is Israel. Up till now, it's been a Gentile uh, detour, so to speak. Well, we saw Daniel 2, the gold, the silver, brass, and iron, iron mixed with clay, Babylon, Persia, Greece, Rome. Now, in Daniel 7, of course, we had the winged lion, and we, we uh, are uh, understanding that that is another uh, allusion to Babylon. And the bear on one side would be descriptive of Persia with the three main battles that established the Persian Empire. Greece, we had this winged leopard, which suggests speed again and so forth. We'll know more about that before it's all over. But then we have the strange guy at the end, the great and terrible beast, no animal uh, considered 
descriptive that's, that uh, apparently evolves into this second phase, the ten heads phase. And uh, so that's a strange perception, but it does seem to be borne out by uh, this and some other passages that we'll look at. Alexander's uh, successors we talked about, Cassander, Lysimachus, Ptolemy, and Seleucus. We'll talk more about them next time. You want to read chapter 8 for, uh, for uh, next time of Daniel. Ptolemy, you'll notice, is the third of these four who took G Egypt, Cyrene, and Arabia. Um, it was during Ptolemy Philadelphus that the Old Testament, the entire Old Testament, was translated into he Greek from the Hebrew. That was finished about 270 B.C., about three centuries before the, the New Testament uh, period. So, uh, uh, and Daniel was part of that. And Antiochus Epiphanes, who will be one of the Seleucid empires, we'll talk about him. He appears as a little horn. Uh, we'll see him in, in a double reference, if you will. We'll get into that next time. And uh, we're in this period between the Persian Empire and Greek Empire. Next time we're going to be dealing with uh, Chapter 8 which is a very, very important prelude uh, and deals with this strange event, uh, well, there's a Septuagint translation, but also the abomination of desolation takes place there, uh, and we'll talk about that when we get to it. Christ refers to that historically as an event yet future, so it's going to happen again. And it's very important for us to understand. There are a lot of misconceptions about that. It's important for us to be very precise and very careful in trying to identify what that really is all about. And. Uh, Rome, meanwhile, of course, is on the rise. It, it took you know, Cassander's kingdom, the Lysimachus. So the four elements of the Greek empire sequentially fall to Rome. And then, of course, Rome emerges about 68 BC and it grows, divides into two legs. And we, we, we will add as a supplement to this study a profile uh, called Europa Rising. We'll include that in the package that's going to be uh, compiled here, sort of like an appendix. But each segment of, uh, that it breaks up into has this era, and we'll talk about that. But let's shift now before we finish. We have a little bit of time here. Let's, uh, let's take a look at Revelation 13, just the first half of it. Because uh, uh, it, This is John now, obviously, not Daniel, but it's John. And as I stood up, uh, 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 upon the sand of the sea, so again, he's apparently on a seashore here, I saw a beast. He's talking about a single beast here. In fact, he's going to talk about a pair, but it's just the first one we're going to focus on. Saw a beast rise up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns. That strikes us rather interestingly because you've got the ten horns and yet three of them seem to be missing. They were apparently the ones that were plucked up. And his horns, upon his horns ten crowns, and upon his heads the name of blasphemy. So this is a blasphemous entity here. Don't confuse it with the Vatican. If the Vatican's evolved, it's the woman that's writing this beast. That's a whole other story in chapter, in chapter 17 of Revelation. But let's move on. The beast which I saw was like unto a leopard, and his feet were as the feet of a bear, and his mouth as the mouth of a lion. And the dragon gave him his power and his seat and great authority. How interesting it is, we've got this leopard, the bear, and the lion. But they're backwards. You notice that? Come from the Daniel vision, they're backwards. See, if, assuming this is the fourth beast, there are three elements of the three preceding. He, he, he was like a leopard, and his feet like a bear, and his mouth is the mouth of a lion. They're backwards because he's looking backwards. See, this, the chronological sequence is one way, but he's there looking back, if you will. And I saw one of the heads, as it were, wounded to death. I saw one of his heads, as it were, wounded to death. And his deadly wound was healed. And all the world wondered after the beast. I'm intrigued with how many prophecy books are full of conjectures about was he really killed or is it just a fake? Doesn't matter. It says as it were wounded, okay. The whole world, uh, his deadly wound was healed. And uh, so uh, apparently that is a, a um, recognition mark of his. He has a head wound. The last verse in Zechariah 11 describes him physically, and he has one eye darkened and one arm withered. We presume, we don't know, we presume that may be an after effect of the wound that he was healed. He, he was alive, but he's got some impediments. And that may be the reason that people who identify with him take his mark on their wrist or on their forehead as a way of identifying with him. It's sort of like wearing an eye patch if you can identify with True Grit or, or, or Moshe Dayan or something. See? Okay. And they worship the dragon which gave power unto the beast. Who is the dragon? 
Satan. He's identified unequivocally in the previous chapter, chapter 12, verse 9. They worship the dragon, that's Satan, which gave power to the beast. This beast is empowered by none other than Satan himself. And they worship the beast, saying, Who is like unto the beast? Who is able to make war with him? He doesn't come to power by violence or warfare. He comes to power by making peace and arranging financing. But he becomes very militarily powerful, and then, of course, that shows up as true color. And... Uh, and there was given unto him a mouth, speaking great things, there it is again, and blasphemies. And power was given unto him to continue for 42 months, which is the same as 1,260 days, which is the same as three and a half years. Do your own arithmetic. And he opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle and them that dwell in heaven. That's interesting. I think you and I are in this verse. Because this is post-rapture. This is after Revelation chapter 4. This is in Revelation 13. He opened his mouth in blasphemy against God to blaspheme his name and his tabernacle. And guess who? Them that dwell in heaven. Oh, we'll be up there in the mezzanine cheering him on. Yeah. <laughs> and it was given unto him to make war with the saints and to overcome them. These are the tribulation saints. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Almost all. We're going to discover in Daniel 11 there is a segment of the planet Earth that is, eludes his grasp. It'll surprise you. It was given unto him to make war with the saints, to overcome them, and power was given unto him over all kindreds, tongues, and nations. That's the generalization. There is an exception that Daniel makes a note of in, in chapter 11. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. You need to be sensitive to the strange idioms of the book of Revelation. In the book of Revelation, there are the earth dwellers. That doesn't mean people living on the earth. It's people who dwell there. Their equity is there. Their heart is there. The earth dwellers. The only celebration on the earth in the book of Revelation is when the earth dwellers celebrate that the two witnesses are dead. Chapter 11, when they lie in the street for three days, everybody exchanges gifts that they're finally dead. And then CNN gets an exclusive. <laughs> All that dwell upon the earth shall worship him whose names are not written in the book of life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. If any man have an ear, let him hear. He that leadeth into captivity shall go into captivity. He that killeth with the sword must be killed with the sword. Here is the patience and the faith of the saints. So that's just a quick snapshot. One of the assignments you can give yourself if you're interested in taking extra assignments is to make a little notebook and collect the idioms and similarities of things that are mentioned in Daniel and things that are mentioned in Revelation. You'll be startled at how they dovetail. Some very obviously, some very subtly, but I'll leave that to you. You won't understand the book of Revelation until you realize that the 404 verses of the book of Revelation include over 800 allusions from the Old Testament. Almost two to one. Two allusions for every verse in the book of Revelation are idioms or phrases or concepts deliberately linked from the Tanakh, the Old Testament. And once you discover the Jewishness of the book of Revelation, then suddenly it all becomes clear. And a uh, fun book. But Daniel is a basic, basic foundation, no matter whatever you're going to do, prophetically, of course. Great, great book. Great guy. So study chapter 8 for next time. Let's stand for a closing word of prayer. God is so good. This book is so tangible, so alive, so direct, on the one hand, and yet it still contains mysteries that will challenge us for a lifetime of Bible study. Let's bow our hearts. Father, we do thank you for your word. We thank you that it has pleased you to do nothing but that which you reveal to your servants, the prophets. We thank you for your word. We thank you, Father, that you have given us your Holy Spirit. We do pray, Father, you'd open this book to our lives and, more importantly, our lives to this book. We just pray, Father, that you would help each of us to grow in grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior, the Son of Man who came to redeem us and has redeemed us. We thank you, Father, for that redemption. And yet, Father, we, as we ponder the, the exciting aspects of your word, we 
can't help but recognize that the horizon is rapidly approaching us. And Father, we would seek to know your heart, to know your will in our lives, that you would illuminate to each one of us specifically what you would have of each of us in the days that remain. We thank you, Father, for the challenges. We thank you, Father, for your Holy Spirit to enlighten us and equip us for those challenges. But in all these things, Father, we just commit ourselves without any reservation into your hands in the name of Yeshua, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Amen.